Welcome everyone. This is Dr. Sharad Jethi from New York. Thank you for watching, learning, and sharing on moneymeterhealth.com, your favorite website dedicated to teaching you about the human heart and its illnesses, as well as making one aware of the healthy heart as well. So thank you again for your enthusiastic interest and support in my cause of spreading this education freely to all. Thank you for associating with moneymeterhealth.com. Without any further ado, I'd like to delve into the subject matter as always, and the matter of the subject today is, let's distinguish between constrictive pericarditis from restrictive cardiomyopathy. As simple as that. So, well, very importantly, we like to distinguish this as for a simple reason, because constrictive pericarditis, remember, needs to be treated by only one thing, and that is removal of the pericardium. So pericardial stripping, if you will. If you do that, or you could do the pericardiectomy totally. So pericardiectomy, that means total removal of the pericardium, will, uh, will result into a total cure uh, from uh, constrictive pericarditis. What is the cause of the constrictive pericarditis? Well, it could be idiopathic, where we do not know the cause, obviously. Or sometimes it is uh, carcinomatosis, so cancer, we'll just call it cancer here. And three, it could be tuberculosis. So these are the two or three causes of constrictive pericarditis that is commonly seen, idiopathic, carcinomatosis, and tuberculosis. So these are the three important causes. Restrictive cardiomyopathy could be of uh, three or four causes. One is amyloid. Uh, sarcoid, it could be hemochromatosis, where there's a tremendous uh, iron overload, and then uh, hyper isonophilic syndrome, HES. So these are the three or four important causes of restrictive cardiomyopathy, and these are the important causes of constrictive, uh, peri uh, uh, constrictive pericarditis. So having said that, now what happens in restrictive cardiomyopathy? The pathology is within the myocardium per se. So essentially, the myocardium is stiff. The ventricles are small, so RV and LV are small. They are non-compliant, so they, are, they have decreased compliance in that setting. And they are stiff, as we said. And then they are thickened. So they are thickened as well. So these are the distinguishing features. All of this could be seen on an echo or echo or a non-invasive uh, CT or MRI that you will perform, but echo is pretty much diagnostic most of the time to define restrictive cardiomyopathy. Only when you have equivocal changes, then perhaps CT, MR, or CAT may have to be done. So just to let you know. So now having understood this, let's understand what are the echo features because there have to be distinguishing features between constrictive pericarditis and the... Uh, so what, what is the echo... Uh, telling us. So the echo is telling us the following. Like constrictive pericarditis, if you were to look at on an echo, the RV pressures will be equal to the LV pressures. RA will be obviously increased and LA will be increased, but the fact is RV equals LV in all pressures, whereas here the LV pressures will be much higher than the RV pressures. So they're not equal in restrictive cardiomyopathy, whereas in constrictive pericarditis they will be equal. A very important distinguishing feature that will definitely be on the bones. The respiratory variation is very important as well. Now, what happens to the respiratory variation? Now, that's, that could be defined the following way. I will just show you as how the graphs go. If uh, in a constrictive pericarditis, if somebody was to take a deep breath, what will happen to the pressures of the left ventricle? The left ventricle pressures will be decreased. So the left ventricle pressures will decrease as we go through the left uh, in, a, in a constrictive pericarditis, whereas the right-sided pressures will increase, and so right ventricle uh, in a constrictive pericarditis will have an increase in uh, these pressures as we go along in our settings. So and the increase or the variation is more than 25% from baseline. So it is very very important that. In constrictive pericarditis, there's a marked increase in the RV pressures in constrictive pericarditis during inspiration and a marked decrease in the left ventricular pressures during inspiration. So just remember that as it decreases like that. And whereas in restrictive cardiomyopathy, the pressures remain unchanged. So that's the, that's the thing. So regardless whether it's inspiration or expiration, 
the pressures in restrictive cardiomyopathy will remain unchanged. So there is no change. Uh, no change. Okay. So these are very distinguishing important features that one needs to keep in mind. And uh, the treatment will obviously depend on the pathology or the etiology of the restrictive cardiomyopathy. So restrictive cardiomyopathy, the treatment plan will be the following. Well, one, for amyloids, specifically if you were to treat, you could treat that with, uh, uh, the transthetatin variety could be treated with uh, a stem cell uh, transplant, if you will. So stem, stem cell transplant is very helpful, especially in the mutant variety or the familial variety. Whereas the primary and the secondary, the heart-lung transplantation is the way to go. Second cause being sarcoid. One understands that here the treatment could be steroids. The good old steroids, they still work. And then, of course, uh, people have tried chloroquine. And they have tried uh, uh, cyclosporin. And they've tried methotrexate. So methotrexate, cyclosporin, and chloroquine in these settings could be tried, but primarily you should try the steroids first. Uh, the third variety is obviously iron overload where there is hemochromatosis. So here the answer is um, as simple as phlebotomy. You remove, uh, keep removing blood uh, every six weeks, like a pint or so, and the chances of the iron load will go down and the cardiac uh, status will improve because they have tremendously high uh, iron loads. So, or iron chelation will be helpful. So people have tried iron chelation in these settings. And uh, then of course, uh, uh, very rarely one does any transplant, but that's controversial. Um, fourthly is hyper eosinophilic syndrome. We call it HES. And those patients are treated commonly by, mostly palliatively. So you do endomyocardial endomyocardiectomy, endomyocardiectomy. And uh, it's, a, it's a very palliative procedure, mainly to improve the symptoms, but there's no survival pattern that's improved. So very rarely this hyperisnophilic syndromes are being treated. Now, loop diuretics, obviously you would wanna use if there is a problem with, uh, say, acute pulmonary edema, or there is a problem with peripheral edema. So one tends to use diuretics for that reason. One tends to use beta blockers, you could use that. One tends to use calcium blockers, and uh, you could use uh, ACE inhibitors as well as uh, ARBs. Uh, they have been shown to improve the patient's uh, ventricular compliance in a diastolic setting. So just like what you would use for a diastolic setting. But just a caveat with beta blockers, remember that some, sometimes it can precipitate a bradycardia, and these patients can go into heart failure, and therefore pacemaking may have to be uh, immediately done. So some patients do not are very sensitive to beta blockers, if you will, because they go into bradycardia and that can precipitate uh, the need for a pacemaker. So that's a caveat just to be attached. Now remember, as I said, uh, constrictive pericarditis needs to be diagnosed rather quick because the treatment is so easy. No medications will ever be required. The patient will be cured forever if you can do the pericardial stripping and pericardiectomy in a setting where there's thickening of the pericardium if diagnosed properly. Now, many times the echo will show it, but if echo does not, if echo is not diagnostic, uh, especially if you cannot see the pericardial thickening, then you end up doing a CT or an MRI. And MRI and CT are diagnostic because that will define in millimeters what the thickness of the pericardium is because we know what the normal thickness is. Um, that's 0.8 centimeters. Now, uh, or eight millimeters. Um, so amyloid, sarcoid, hemochromatosis, and uh, of course, uh, other causes like uh, uh, hyperisnophilic syndrome, they have specific treatments. And like what we discussed, right, ranging from stem cell to steroids to heart transplants, like we just discussed here based on the etiology. So their treatment plans are also very specific and therefore the diagnosis is extremely, extremely important. And many times these patients present like, uh, hardly a shade of difference between the two in the clinical syndromes when they present. There'll be predominantly more right heart failure than the left heart failure. There will be history of tuberculosis. That gives you a clue of constrictive pericarditis. A patient has had quime tests and that's been positive for sarcoid. That gives you a clue of restrictive cardiomyopathy. If patients had primary or secondary amyloids like uh, kidney disease or uh, chronic infections, etc., 
So, you know, there will be some uh, evidence of history clinical syndrome that you'll have to ascertain to distinguish between these two. Now, many times, constricted pedicarditis, as I said, could be totally idiopathic, one does not know. Or, it, by the way, you should also include RT, uh, RT to the chest. That means uh, radiation therapy offered to the chest can lead to constricted pedicarditis. Also, 8, 10, 15 years later, it can manifest. Like, but there will be a history that this person was treated for Hodgkin's disease or lymphoma by radiations 10 years ago, eight years ago, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these. So, you know, this was, uh, I know it was a pretty intense, uh, quick course on distinction between uh, constrictive pericarditis and restrictive cardiomyopathy here. But just so that you're aware that that's, that's the goal at moneymeterhealth.com. We want to try and give you the capsulated form of our, uh, you know, important features in cardiology. So this way, one is in readiness to take the boards. And obviously these, uh, these are primarily geared for the exams both for the students, residents, fellows, and uh, tenings. And also for clinical practice, somebody comes across and you get called like, hey, look, overnight you're called by, by, the, by the house staff, and the next morning, all you have to do is just open up this uh, moneymeterhealth.com, look up my uh, constrictive pericarditis versus restrictive cardiomyopathy, and over a cup of coffee, you're all set to go and see the patient. So this is the advantage of moneymeterhealth.com that I personally see, and I'm ready to impart now in my juncture of this, my stage of my life, I want to give it out to the world and say, look, you know, here it is in a matter of seven to nine minutes, my video vignette ready for you to uh, grab the information. Once again, get your colleagues, get your associates uh, more, um, you know, attracted to moneymeterhealth.com. It's a free knowledge available to all of you. And uh, at this point, uh, I think I'm running out of time on my video vignette, but uh, we'll meet you again in my next uh, section. Thank you again, and so long. This is Dr. Shiraz Jaitley from New York.